So we're very pleased today to have with us Rabbi Mark Schneier, president of the Foundation for Ethnic Understanding and the founding senior rabbi of the Hampton Synagogue in West Hampton Beach. Welcome, Rabbi Schneier. Good morning, and some pleasure always to be with you. Thank you. So I want to jump in actually talking, you know, this is a um, conference, as you know, for the EAJC, and I wanted to start by talking about Soviet Jewry. You and your father were quite involved in the late Soviet years in establishing the organized Jewish life uh, in the post-Soviet era. What are your memories? What roles did you play? And how did this Jewish life come about in a place where there had been no Judaism for so long? Look, I remember fondly from my childhood the pioneering efforts of my father, Rabbi Arthur Schneier. While masses of Jews outside of the Soviet Union were protesting, demonstrating on the streets, let my people go, it was Rabbi Arthur Schneier who headed up the movement of let my people grow. My father, in his infinite wisdom, understood that one day when the gates would be open from the Soviet Union, that most Jews would decide to remain, that most Jews would not take advantage of the opportunities of coming either to Israel or to the United States, and why it was so important, it was imperative to plant the seeds, the foundation for the regrowth of Jewish life in the Soviet Union. So I recall so many wonderful, wonderful memories of uh, my parents hosting uh, the late chief rabbi of uh, Moscow, Rabbi Yudhul Levin. This is back in 1968. In fact, they tell the story. I was, I think, in the third grade at Ramaz at the time. And I came home and I walked into the dining room and saw this very... Uh, the saintly uh, figure sitting in my father's chair. Rabbi Levin had a long beard. I didn't know who Rabbi Levin was. And I started berating him. How could you be sitting in my father's chair? You have to appreciate, you know, the, the home that I grew up in. It was all about etiquette and manners. And, you know, it was very, very formal like that. And then my father <laughs> ran in uh, to the diamond and says, Mark, Mark, stop. No, this is the chief <laughs> rabbi of Moscow, Rabbi Yudel Levin. And then it was my father who really uh, identified the first four rabbinical students, uh, I believe two from Moscow, two from Leningrad at the time. And he was the one who facilitated and sponsored uh, their enrollment at the rabbinical seminary um, in, the, uh, in uh, Budapest. Uh, Hungary, and then that's Rabbi Shayevich, um, is probably of that group. You know, he's he's the star. You know, today he's the chief rabbi of uh, Russia. But again, I remember going through that whole process. Um, I hold the uh, very very uh, uh, unique achievement in 1972. Uh, I became the first and only American, really. Uh, Jew outside the Soviet Union to ever celebrate his bar mitzvah in Moscow. It was at the Coral Synagogue uh, in July. Um, and the place was overflowing. Must have been thousands of people there. Um, they came to see what a modern day yeshiva student is like. You know, they're not been exposed. You know, this is before social media and internet. And suddenly, you know, here I come from uh, New York City. And I can lead the service at the age of 13. I can read the Torah, read the Haftarah, uh, give a bar mitzvah speech, which I delivered in Yiddish at the time. Um, I remember in 1989, it's even before, I'm sorry, 1988, before Perestroika, um, when my father arranged, I had just joined him at Parkey Synagogue, and we did an exchange. The uh, chief rabbi, of uh, Russia and the cantor of Russia exchanged pulpits with me um, and the cantor of Parkey Synagogue. And this became the Passover story on the NBC Nightly News with Tom Brokaw, with, on CBS with Dan Rather. They had cameras. There. I mean, they, they estimated 
there were 10,000 people who gathered because Passover uh, was such a um, celebratory, and, and it was the festival where Jews would gather not only in the synagogue, but on you know outside on the streets. So I went through this whole process, and my father came under attack. Uh, people, you know, the masses uh, said, no, 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 we have to let them out. You know, we have to make demands. Why are you wasting your time uh, schooling future rabbis? Or my father was the one who reprinted. He sponsored the uh, reprinting of the first Sidor, the first prayer book, the first Humash, uh, since the um, establishment of the Soviet Union. He did all these things, the Matzot, you know, again, you know, I'm, I'm not taking anything away from the greater community that was involved with the Refuseniks, with the Sharanskys and Mendeleviches of the world. But it was Rabbi Arthur Schneier who understood. It's not only let my people go, well, let my people grow. I and love it. And history proved him right because right. most Jews, most Jews chose to remain. And then you saw the tremendous growth of so many uh, movements from the JDC to Chabad uh, to the establishment of the Russian Jewish Congress, the Euro Asian Jewish Congress. All of these. Uh, really uh, extraordinary organizations today should uh, need a little dose of history. It was Rabbi Arthur Schneier um, who single-handedly um, raved and, and uh, he really projected and promoted the movement of let my people grow. Well, it's interesting because, you know, I think that you probably take after your father quite a bit and that you uh, might not be working in the Soviet uh, spheres as much today, but you're working to grow many other aspects of connection, Jewish life, connection between people who are different, especially in the work that you've done in Azerbaijan and in that region, in the Gulf states, and of course, recently with Turkey. Um, I want to um, move into that for just a moment, if it's okay, and focus on uh, the work that's been going on. Azerbaijan, for example, just in the last week, Agreed uh, to be the first Shiite country to open an embassy in Israel. Um, by the time people watch this, it'll be a couple of weeks. They signed on the dotted line and it's moving forward. Um, and you've been traveling there for a long time. What makes Azerbaijan so open to Israel? Tell me about the country and how you were able to do this. Well, first, you know, I'm proud. I don't believe that there is anyone in the Jewish world that President Aliyev is closer to than to myself. Um, not only have I heard that from the president, I remember the uh, current ambassador uh, of Israel to Azerbaijan, uh, George Deke, who, by the way, happens to be the only uh, Arab Christian um, ambassador in the Israeli Foreign Ministry about two years ago. Because I'm I'm always I'm in Baku uh, two to three times a year. Whenever I'm there, I see President Aliyev, and this was during COVID. And it was February 2021, I was going to see um, President Leif and George uh, came to see me. He had just been appointed ambassador a few months before. He says, he says, Rabbi Mark, I don't know if you get who you are in this country. I said, why? He said, when I uh, handed over my credentials to President Leif, he said to me, you know, my two favorite members of the worldwide Jewish community our Prime Minister Netanyahu and Rabbi Mark Schneier and George remind me, and there's no more Prime Minister Netanyahu. So I'm very, very blessed, you know, in this relationship. And I am very connected to Azerbaijan and to President Aliyev because I believe, and, and I've said this publicly many, many times, that among the 57 Muslim nations, when it comes to its relationship with Israel, when it comes to the way it treats its indigenous Jewish community, when it comes to being a beacon of interreligious and interfaith dialogue and coexistence, Azerbaijan is number one. It is simply number one. People don't appreciate the fact that um, Azerbaijan you know, has either the first or second largest Jewish community of any Islamic country. 
and this is you know there, you know there how, are i'm sorry to interrupt you but you know how many jews that is how many jews are living in australia probably they, they estimate about twenty five thousand jews wow. between baku and the mountain jewish community um and i i must tell you that um azerbaijan uh it, it it's just a natural natural process and and love affair with its jewish community for that matter with all religious communities you know i i deal with enough heads of state that over the years have had to declare quote unquote a year of tolerance in azerbaijan for the last 1000 years every year has been a year of tolerance it is just what azerbaijan is and and i'll give you a perfect example this is all public information <laughs> you can ask the israeli master a year ago december in fact it's an appropriate conversation it was last hanukkah i was in baku i was in azerbaijan the israeli embassy is having the hanukkah party and the hanukkah party was scheduled for seven and i saw president Aliyev at his palace at 5 30. and the uh chief rabbi of uh, azerbaijan rabbi schneer siegel had lamented to me the fact that uh, the only Jewish day school in Azerbaijan, for that matter, the only Jewish day school in, uh, in Central Asia, they were having some very, very serious financial problems. Uh, a deficit of more than a quarter of a million dollars. What can we do? Is there any way you could speak to President uh, Aliyev to help us? So I went to see President Aliyev, and we're discussing different topics. And I said, Mr. President, you know that you're blessed being the host to the largest uh, Jewish community in the Islamic world. But with that comes a certain responsibility, whether it's the upkeep of synagogues, schools, kosher restaurants. And I told him about this situation with the Jewish day school. And before I even completed the conversation, Rabbi Siegel, I saw uh, President Aliyev pass a note to one of his um, uh, you know, staff members who was present. Rabbi Siegel already got a call that uh, please tell the Azerbaijan Jewish community that I will take care of the entire deficit. Mm -hmm. And... This and and then and then President Aliyev said to me, "Look, I know it's Hanukkah, so announce this publicly. This is my Hanukkah gift to the Baku Jewish community." And I made the announcement, you know, right then and there. And in addition, we had a whole discussion about opening up the embassy in Tel Aviv. And he said, "And and I have to send you the recording of of my public speech. There are four hundred people there, including many ministers of Azerbaijan. You know, the economic minister, the finance minister, the uh, housing minister, the minister Mikhail Jabarov, who is not only the economic uh, minister of uh, Azerbaijan, but he is the one who's in charge of relations with the state of Israel. And um, we had this discussion." So I made the announcement that it was going to happen in uh, 2022. Now I see it's going to happen in 2023. But when um, Ambassador D called me just 10 days ago, oh, did you hear? I want to thank you. You had so much to do with it. I said, you know what? Let me go back to my notes because I remember the dates that President Aliyev and I discussed as to when the... Um, embassy should be open. You know, we, we're looking for, for a significant date, which is in my notes. I'm not at liberty to discuss what that date is, but that's an example of how blessed I am to have these very, very strong, um, intimate relationships with heads of state. You know, I refer to this as interfaith diplomacy, so whether it's President Aliyev, whether it's President Tokayev of Kazakhstan, whether it's President Erdogan of Turkey, whether it's the Mir of Qatar, whether it's the uh, King of uh, Bahrain, where I've been officially appointed as his special advisor for interfaith affairs, um, I celebrate and I treasure, I treasure these relationships. But, you know, I'm not, you know, the kind of guy who just showed up on the scene. You know, I pioneered this field more than 18 years ago. And this is years and years of cultivating 
and developing these relationships in good times and bad times. And I'm very, very blessed. And, you know, my magnificent obsession, my preoccupation is how can I channel these relationships for the betterment of the state of Israel and for the betterment of the Jewish communities in those respective countries? That's my uh, myopic focus uh, in terms of how I manage these uh, very, very unique relationships that I enjoy. Incredible. Now, I mean, in recent, uh, even more recent, I would say, you know, before the Abraham Accords and certainly since there's been even uh, there's been a lot of work going on in terms of understanding more of the people to people that more people are able to do what you're doing since we've signed the Abraham Accords in the sense that there is relations. But there's been something really unique that's happened in the last, I guess, maybe a year and a half or so, which is the um, increased focus on Holocaust education in the Gulf countries. Um, and I think that's really fascinating for us to talk about for a few minutes. Um, it was, uh, I think, the UAE that first did a ceremony to commemorate, but also Saudi Arabia has even taken some steps towards uh, acknowledging and talking, educating about the Holocaust. So, um, so I'm, 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 I'm going to correct you there. Please. The first country, uh, you know, again, I'm a rabbi of many firsts. So uh, I'll tell you, the first country was the kingdom of Bahrain. Really? Uh, long, yeah, long before the uh, Abraham Accords, I think in four years before it was either 2016 or 17, uh, the King of Bahrain um, sent out a directive to his ambassador in France, in Paris, to attend the community's Holocaust commemoration. That was the first representative of any Gulf state to participate in that kind of ceremony. And then uh, I believe it was either two or three, it, it may have been even three years ago, um, I hosted the first Kristallnacht commemoration with the participation of a representative of an Arab country. And that was Where the was that? ambassador. It was because of COVID, it was on Zoom. Ah. Um, and it was the ambassador of uh, Bahrain to the United States, my very dear and cherished friend, Ambassador uh, Sheikh uh, Abdullah al-Khalifa, um, and it was with the March of the Living, the ambassador of Bahrain, with the head of the indigenous Jewish community in Bahrain. Uh, you know, Bahrain has the only, uh, again, I keep referring to indigenous Jewish community, it's not exactly a community of great numbers. I mean, there are 37 Jews there. <laughs> Um, but uh, nevertheless, it has the only synagogue, um, historic, you know, synagogue in the Gulf. So that the first really Holocaust commemoration that ever took place uh, involving a uh, state, a, a Gulf state, um, the credit must go to um, His Majesty, the King of Bahrain, who has so many credits. You know, it was the king and... Uh, 2013, he was uh, the first Gulf leader uh, to uh, legislate Hezbollah as a terrorist organization. In 2015, it was the King of Bahrain um, who actually led the charge for all members of the GCC to legislate Hezbollah as a terrorist organization. It was the King of Bahrain who, right after uh, President Trump announced the moving of the embassy, from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem two weeks later, there was an interfaith delegation of Bahrainian religious leaders in Jerusalem, uh, which was a very, very courageous stand for His Majesty to take. How often, you know, I, I was the first rabbi ever invited to meet with the um, king uh, in the palace. This goes back to 2011, so the last 11 years, you know, I'm a frequent uh, guest at the palace. In fact, I was just there two weeks ago. Um, Bahrain uh, held a uh, international global religious forum called the Bahrain Dalek Forum. Um, and Pope Francis um, was, of course, the honored guest. This was the second visit of the Pope uh, to the region. The first was in 2019 in Abu Dhabi, where again I spoke on behalf of the Jewish uh, people at that conference following the Pope, as I did you know, in uh, Bahrain. 
So how often, you know, did uh, his majesty lament to me and saying, you know, Rabbi, you know, I have diplomatic relations with this country, with this country, some of them are not my friends. Uh, why, why don't I have diplomatic relations with the state of Israel? And I think that it was really the king of Bahrain who created uh, this new environment uh, in the Gulf. He really deserves uh, the credit uh, because over the years he always spoke. I remember in 2016, I'm, I'm with him in the palace, and he said, I quote now, the only hope for a moderate Arab voice in the regions having a strong Israel. Right. And I look so at I want to um, just I don't want to stop you, but I do want to make sure that we get back to the question at hand, which is sure. the Holocaust. Um, can you just give me some recent examples, though, of um, since the amazing work that you just described in Bahrain that have happened in the region that you've been involved with with regards to Holocaust education? And how close do you think we are potentially to having some of these countries, if any, accept the uh, International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance working definition of anti-Semitism, which would, of course, be the next step? Well, I, I think we have different challenges in different regions. First, in terms of Holocaust education, Azerbaijan this year, uh, for the first time, they actually, government-sponsored, not Jewish community-sponsored, uh, government-sponsored, held a Holocaust commemoration. I know Kazakhstan also participated uh, in the UN commemoration date. As you mentioned, I, um, uh, the ceremony that had taken place just a few years ago in the UAE, Bahrain is on board, Saudi Arabia. Um, let's look at uh, my dear friend Mohammed Al Issa, the Secretary General of the Muslim World League. You know, we forget he's also the former Minister of Justice of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. So that the Saudis had that connection when Mohammed Al Issa led the delegation of imams uh, with the American Jewish Committee uh, to uh, Auschwitz. Um, so it's just an evolving, evolving process in terms of really learning more about the Jewish people. You know, whenever I speak of Muslim-Jewish relations, not only do I refer to our common faith, but our common fate and how our single destiny must strengthen our bonds of concern, compassion, caring for each other. There are no two other faith communities that are more in common than Islam and Judaism. And that's why you're seeing this tremendous euphoria and excitement between Muslims and Jews. In terms of the definition, it's trickier in Central Asia. I actually spoke with President Tokayev, President of Kazakhstan, about this, and he said, Rabbi, you know, it's not an issue of, of signing on and not signing on. There's no anti-Semitism here. Mm -hmm. It's true. There's no anti-Semitism in Kazakhstan. There's no anti-Semitism in Azerbaijan. There's no anti-Semitism in Uzbekistan because Jews are like any other members of that community. Um, in terms of the Gulf, uh, it will come. It will come. Again, you know, I'm not going to sit here in this interview, Mayan, and represent that we've reached the promised land of Muslim-Jewish relations. But, you know, let me remind you, it took 40 years in the wilderness to get to the promised land. I'm not suggesting it's going to take 40 years to get to the promised land of Muslim-Jewish relations, but the good news is the journey has begun. We're well on our way to the promised land. Significant benchmarks and landmarks along the journey. And that's why I am so buoyantly optimistic when it comes to Muslim-Jewish relations globally. Amazing. So I know that we're going to run out of time. We're happy to do this interview, unfortunately, on Zoom with you being in the U.S. and me here in Israel. So before the Zoom uh, closes off, I do want to have a minute to talk about the recent uh, accomplishment, which was uh, being able to play a role in bringing back together Turkey and Israel to some form of a normalization. Um, I understand you were actually pretty strategically involved there. Give us a little bit of a window into what happened. Well, it was two summers ago. Um, it was actually my idea. I uh, hosted uh, the ambassador of Turkey to the United States, Murat Mershon. We had gone very, very close. He had asked me uh, several months before to help facilitate uh, an interfaith iftar at the embassy in Washington. And he said to me right before the iftar, because we had, we had not met face to face because of Zoom, 
He said, look, I was sent here by President Erdogan for two reasons, to repair my relationship with the United States government and to repair Turkey's relationship with the American Jewish media. Have any suggestions? I said, yes, I can answer that in one word. And the answer is Israel. And he came to the Hampton Synagogue in July. We had a wonderful dialogue. And right after the dialogue, I said, let's go upstairs to my office. Let's call President Erdogan now. President Herzog was just elected president of Israel. Be very, very significant. Let President Erdogan call President Herzog to congratulate him. That was on a Sunday. On Monday, the call was made. The rest is history. One day, I'll write the book. It's all on my WhatsApp. And it, I was intimately involved. I mean, it was really a partnership between myself and Ambassador uh, Mershon. I have calls, President Erdogan. Uh, oh, I just read that President uh, Herzog's mother passed away. What is the procedure? Uh, how do I express condolences? President Herzog calling me. I just heard President Erdogan had COVID. Should I call him? When should I call him? I, I, it was, I was okay. intimately intimately involved, and I brought President Herzog uh, to Ankara, to President Erdogan's palace last March. Uh, in fact, I'm bringing my congregation this March on our congregational mission. First, we're going to Saudi Arabia, and then to uh, Turkey, where we're going to mark the first anniversary of the historic rapprochement uh, between Turkey and the state of Israel. Incredible. Wow. Well, this is, first of all, so moving, so educational. I am sure that all of our listeners are going to be as uh, interested as I am. And I really appreciate you getting up early in the morning U.S. time to speak to me here in Israel. And uh, I hope you have a wonderful day. And we thank you so much for being with us. It's my pleasure, Mayan. I have to go back to uh, Qatar next week for the closing ceremonies for what the media has referred to as Mark Schneier's bagel diplomacy <laughs> but i must tell you when i agreed to do this back in 2017 at the request of the emir and hassan al-fwadi who was secretary general of the world cup and we agreed to three conditions number one there would be access to kosher food number two all jews would be welcome particularly israelis number three direct flights from tel aviv to doha the qataris delivered on all three commitments to me it's something to celebrate, and I'm telling you, and all our viewers, hold on to your seats. There is great news down the road uh, when it comes to Qatar and Israel. Wow, amazing. What a great way to end. Thank you so much. Take My pleasure. Care. Bye. All right, take care. Bye-bye.